Ta ta. The music you heard earlier was. Where is my. Jesus. There you go. Uh, was Kimiko. Uh, Kimiko basically out. Uh, uh, well, made Bach public domain. Because Bach is dead for quite some time, so the Bach music is public domain, but any recording is it, isn't. Because, well, there's people who actually done that. Um, she didn't like that, so she basically open sourced Bach, and we liked that a lot. And we is uh, Ohm, uh, we, and we liked her for a, we like we liked her. We, uh, so we asked her to give a presentation on a hacker conference, and she said, "Well, sure, I'll do that, but once I'm there, I might as well play a bit." That's a, well, that could be a problem because she's a classic pianist, so she needs an actual piano. You can't really give her a keyboard, can you? So. We need a, a Bösendorf, which is expensive, is also expensive to insure. We want it in the middle of a field, <laughs> in a hot tent, uh, so it has to be tuned over and over and over again, and we have to find an actually a supplier who's willing to lend us something, something like that. So it's a lot of problems with a potential awesome. And us hackers, of course, we did it, because and in the end, it was awesome. So, us hackers tend to not steer away from big problems or from bigger problems than absolutely necessarily because potential awesome. Um, hacker camps like this and others um, spawned quite a lot of very good initiatives that were better that that bettered the world. I mean, I'm talking about open source ISPs, uh, open source initiative at all. Uh, cryptophones, uh, all sorts of stuff. Well, you guys know. So if you look at, at at all these, well, it could be federal agents, but it's all alphabet jumbo. But at these points, I think these uh, th th these these venues are important, and not just the digital world, but but the world at, at, at large. But if you look at all these, I mean, yes, there is a lot. There's some are every four years, some are every two years, some are every year. But it all boils down to about one week a year. And that's less than 2% efficiency. That's not really what we're aiming for, I think. So you might think, well, you can do that more, like in a hackerspace. But then again, Hackerspace, most hackerspaces don't really like sleepovers, at least, at, at least not a mass. So it's not really a 24 7 thing. It's not even a 7 thing, let alone a 24 7 thing. Okay, who am I? I'm Jos Weyers. I'm a member of Tool. I'm a member of, member of Hack42. I did stuff for Ohm, and during daytime, I do the cybers. Um, and I have a dream. The dream starts off with the most awesome hackerspace in existence. Those are not my words, mind you. Um, those are the words of Hacker Day, who visit quite a lot of hackerspaces and, well, came up with that. That's an awfully nice building. And at this end, there's even a church that we can use. And we even did a, a hacker wedding there, so it's full operational. So this, I think, is an awesome hackerspace that we maybe need to supersize. <laughs> Make it bigger, have more rooms to enable it to have sleepovers. And uh, maybe we need a nice entrance, just because can. Um, a couple of weeks ago, this plot came on the market. And I want it. It's, uh, at the moment, it's housing uh, refugees, but that's, uh, that's supposed to be a temporary uh, uh, situation, and it actually is, because this is an old uh, jail, and the, 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 the PR thing of housing refugees in jails is apparently frowned upon. So, but I don't mind, I won't. So a couple of weeks ago, this, this came to market, and uh, I had the dream for way longer than that, but because it came to market, uh, we, kind of got a kick in the butt to actually place a bit on the on the thing. And uh, actually, at the moment, it's not, but that means we just have more time. Um, the spot, how big it is. Well, this is our main building at, at the hackerspace. This whole building fits, uh, of course, it doesn't work. Fit, does, can you see this? Yeah. 
Okay, it fits in this one. So yes, it's supersized. The tiny little round thing here is a open space. And because you guys do feet and inches and shillings and God knows what, and we do meters, I, I have no idea how to, uh, how to compare to that. So we'll put some stuff in it. In this open space, this building fits. <laughs> and yes, that's the White House. So much for world domination. You can actually, and you can still walk around it. So it's stupid big. Um, if you're not into architecture, this also fits to fully adult grown blue whales, back to back, yes, and you still walk around it. Height, if you put the, uh, this uh, miracle thing straight up, then it just does not fit. <laughs> but just, if you leave the nose cone, you're done. So if you print a one-to-one -one mock up of a space shuttle, I have the spot to do that. Cool. Okay. This is the plot. This has lots of it. Um, it's brilliant. And what we're going to do is we're going to start a, a foundation. And uh, that's going to procure the funds. And with those, we're going to buy the stuff. And this foundation will, the, the first uh, uh, tenant will be Hack42. And uh, yeah, th that will have perks. What I want in this, because the, the, the facility has, uh, just a dome alone, has 200 uh, rooms. That's just a dome. Rooms are, rooms are us. If you look at this, let's do a, ta-da. So, 200, still visible? Okay. So that's 200, tiny hotel room, uh, like like dormitory kind, uh, hostel, uh, th th that kind of level. Because mind you, they are tiny. So those we're gonna uh, give out and hire out, uh, rent out, it depends on who's coming. And uh, so that gives you your 24 seven presence. Uh, this will be, where are we? This will be office space for startups, tech companies, and uh, uh, mind you, tech companies we like, and <laughs> it's going to be uh, yeah, it's going to be different. Um, this is a sports arena, so we just print a big white H on it and be done with it. Um, <laughs> again, we will have a church because well, can't downgrade, can you? Um, so it will be a hacker space, but stupidly supersized. Uh, my idea is it becoming a, a, a European hacker hub, like the European hacker hub. So if you come to Europe, of course you go there. Um, there will be uh, more uh, luxurious uh, uh, accommodations than just the hostel. Uh, those will be primarily for our paying customers. Um, we're looking at ways to get uh, electricity virtually for free. And that will get us, uh, as one of the first clients, uh, will, will be a ISP or a uh, uh, colo location, because, well, the, the, their, main, uh, their main cost is electricity and ours isn't. Um, we're also have, uh, having contacts with universities. Uh, you can house PhD students here for God, lo God knows how long. And, uh, of course, as a hackerspace, now you can have hackers in residence. So if you have a hacker coming from abroad, just, well, you can house him. There will be uh, uh, eating facilities uh, at, this is the other way around. Here, the, the, this, is, uh, this is the brilliant entrance you, you saw the picture of. Um, there will be a coffee place with all the, uh, all, all the things that should be. And there will be a canteen also, which will be serving food at almost cost. So not leaving the hacker compound will not kill you. That's the idea. Uh, how am I on time? Okay, cool. Okay, that's uh, the other way around. So that, that's the initiative. And, well, you, you saw me pointing at, 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 at buildings and every now and then telling what we're going to do with it. And I didn't point at them all for a reason. I have no idea. Because it's so stupid big that there are still a ton of options. Actually, our old hacker space, which was bigger than a new one, also had that. We had rooms to spare. 
which gives you options and flexibility. So if you come, if somebody comes along and says, I have this cool project, I need that room for about three months. And then it's a tiny, tiny vote and yeah, fuck it, go for it. So that's that, that kind of flexibility works. Because just looking at that humongous space in the middle, what the hell do you want to do with it? I don't know. <laughs> I have some options, but I mean, one of them was, uh, because it's an old building, um, we thought a message system, and being not IP, so tiny quadcopters oozing around from between all those 200 rooms, that would be awesome. It's a bit of Harry Potter-esque, but then techy. It's, uh, it's brilliant. So the idea is to actually get there, because it's in Arnhem, which is quite central in Europe, if you look at it in a weird way, which is what we do. Um, then it will be quite central, and it will be brilliant, and you can get there. It's, uh, it'd be in a prison, of, call, of course it's walled, it's in the middle of the city, but because it's walled and the walls are quite thick and quite high, um, you can get away with quite a lot without disturbing the neighbors, which is, yeah, kind of what we want to do. So um, the church will be used for, well, of course, all our weddings. And at least once a week, they will be given a lecture. And, uh, and that will be open for the public, of course. And yeah, basically, that's it. I mean, so you have tech companies who, uh, oh, yeah. And one thing we do, we try to, uh, to make the canteen and the coffee place that interesting and that cheap that no one will uh, even think of putting a coffee machine in his own room. So the canteen will be the living, uh, uh, the, the mingled place of all the people. So if you just come in, oh, that's, that's, uh, that's cheap office space, I'll rent it and I won't bother with the rest of us, then you'll have a very short lease. Uh, basically the same goes for the, uh, for, for the housing cost for the, for, for the building itself. So that's basically it. So we're looking for a couple of million now. <laughs> and um, actually, what, what we're looking for is not so much, well, of course we're looking for money, everybody is. But we're actually looking, yep, we're actually looking mostly for ideas. So if you have a bold idea that needs room, that we will have. Uh, Time-wise, this is in about, hopefully we'll be here in about three years. So it's a process. So. If you're interested, drop me a line at this address. Uh, there's a, a little tiny quiz asking a, a couple of, of questions. Uh, none you have to answer, but please do. And well, looking forward to your great ideas and hopefully I can join you. Uh, you will join us at the opening party in about three years in this awesome space. And now I'm done. So, um, I'm BSB, and um, I'm here to try and keep things moving uh, as they all fall apart. This is affectionately known as the Muppet Show, because it's the lightning talks, and there's always some technical difficulties. Um, I have to say thanks again to Yoss for opening things up for us. Uh, I really enjoy this guy's company, because he rocks a suit and uh, steel-toed boots at the same time. And as an industrial systems hacker, I really appreciate this, right? Uh, a lot of times I go on an engagement, and I have to find dress shoes that are also steel-capped, so I can go out to the, to the you know, electrical plant and do some work, but also go back and present uh, the findings to, to, the, to the execs. So um, we have a couple of basic announcements. Uh, one is they need lots more volunteers today. So if you're willing to work in the kitchen, we'll feed you. And if you're willing to uh, work audio-visual uh, stuff tonight, they really need people on the AV teams and speaker ops teams for this evening. So please volunteer. We really appreciate it. Um, secondly, if there's anyone else doing a lightning talk in the room that signed up in advance, I'd like you to please come to the front so I can identify you and know, know who's here. Uh, we had lightning talk uh, difficulties this year because we were trying to schedule some of them and leave the Friday night ones open and flexible. Um, and that wasn't made uh, sufficiently clear to everyone else. Um, so are we good? We good for the next one? All right. So um, I really enjoy standing up here in these bright lights because then, you know, I'm blind and I can't see anything and I don't know what any of you are doing. Um, so I appreciate it when you make noise for the speakers. Um, and in particular, this speaker got cut off last night, which is really quite a tragedy. 
because he wanted to show you his API. He was hoping that you would hack some things here at the camp. Um, and they have a really exciting project. So I won't say any more about it. I'll let him, let him uh, say what he likes about his own project. But uh, please give a warm round of applause to, to Charles uh, Yarnold for uh, waiting until today to give his talk. Yours, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm also giving out badges while things uh, continue to not stream properly. So I've been to a lot of conferences um, and I've enjoyed myself. And uh, we might play a game with these badges later. Um, I'm just talking until you let me know that that presentation is sorted out. Um, so anybody want a badge? Are you awake? Is anyone awake? Have you had coffee? You want a badge? All right. So the right side is louder than the left side. What are you guys going to do about that? You want a badge? There you go. Um, I'm sort of the redneck Mr. T in this sort of scenario, um, partly because of the hat, partly because I grew up in the States. So left side, not awake, hasn't had any coffee. All right. Right side? Yeah, you're not doing very well. Um, so what has the left side done? Anybody giving talks? Yes? No? Are you awake? There's talks over there. Oh, you're lightning talk speakers as well, right? Okay, cool. Come on up to the front. You can have badges. Just take a badge. Yeah, just take one. In a little while, we, we will use these for some sort of silly game. Um, and you can see how you enjoy that. There you go. Cool, one for each of you. Um, and we still having trouble with the streaming? Yeah, this is why this is the Muppet Show. So usually we play the Muppet Show theme tune uh, because, you know, we're Muppet shuffling, right? We move around, we do our lightning talks. Um, like I said, I really appreciate the lightning talks. I don't know about the rest of you, but um, it's difficult to get up and speak for the first time. And even if you've spoken before, you have a strange idea. Um, yesterday, I told a joke about Lambda Calculus and the audience actually laughed. I, I found it amazing. I'm not used to audiences laughing at jokes, particularly Lambda Calculus jokes, but that's uh, EMF camp for you, right? Um, I've had a really good time. I hope you guys have. Um, have you said thank you to the organizers? No? On Twitter at least? Or like in a text message? No? They do appreciate that. How's it going, Charles? All right. Good. Well, um, how about a warm round of applause for the EMF camp organizers? Thank you. Very nice of you. Good. Almost there. Oh, moving slides around. All right, cool. Um, a JDuck presentation. I'm a big fan of JDuck. In fact, that's worth an anecdote. I went to 44Con um, two years ago or something, and there were a bunch of people playing the Capture the Flag competition, and there was uh, one team that was beating all of the other teams severely. Uh, had something like 40 challenges out of 50, and the others were still solving um, 10 or so. And uh, I was standing outside, and I said, you know, who is this person, uh, this team? Uh, and J-Duck walked up, and he was like, oh, that's me. I just thought I'd do the whole CTF on my own. I didn't, I didn't need a team of eight. I'd just uh, rock on. And he is a very talented guy. So he did uh, win that competition. Um, and then uh, let the second place people have the prize, because it was sort of unfair to be competing against J-Duck, right? Anybody know J-Duck? Right? It's tough. No? Still not set. It's really difficult up there. Honestly, those lights are really bright. That's why I'm hanging out down here with you. Um, I'm not used to sunlight, as you can imagine. They don't let industrial systems hackers out into the sun. Okay. All right, we're all set. Go ahead, Charles. Nice round of applause for Charles again. Do the talking for us every once in a while, I guess. Hello. Oh, there you go. Oh, this never gets not nerve-wracking. Um, hi, I'm Charles, um, and I'm responsible for the weird uh, white cubes that are all around the camp. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, they are Lumos nodes. Um, they're also known as, what's that weird white box you're putting next to my tent? It's not going to make lots of noise, is it? Um, I promise you there's no hidden bass speakers, but... 
I'm thinking next time distributed base around the camp just so we can drop the base at midnight as the curfew hits. Uh, but I'm not sure if the organizers will like that or not. Um, this uh, is a project that I actually uh, wanted to do way back at the first EMF. Um, the idea was to have distributed light around the campsite that was running off of the same uh, NRF modules that the first camp badge uses. Um, and it was going to be a nice distributed network of uh, blinky LEDs. Uh, but then EMF actually happened. <laughs> Um, and I was responsible for setting up the stages, uh, getting in all the hire kit, uh, designing the first EMF badge and getting it manufactured, driving around in a golf buggy and delivering stuff. Um, and at the last moment, our caterers pulled out and uh, Claire and I rented a food truck and cooked meat for an entire weekend. Uh, and then we didn't eat meat for about three months because we couldn't stand the smell of cooking meat anymore. Um, so sadly, that all had to go in a box in the corner and uh, it never got made. Uh, so I thought as uh, it's been a couple of EMFs time, I'd actually try and get these projects done uh, that I'd never managed to do. Um, so yeah, this year I thought I'd actually try and make it. Uh, I had all of the gear from the first EMF uh, but I thought, I've got time, it's January, I've got a few months, uh, so maybe I'll improve it. Um, so instead of just using these Wi-Fi modules that were a bit flaky and they couldn't be very, very far apart, I thought, why not use Wi-Fi? We've got Wi-Fi around the camp, that, that would be stable and nice. Um, this was before I heard from my friends who made the badges this year that they'd also be using 2.4 gigahertz for the badges. So. It, it's it's still holding up, but um, they have to be very close to the DKs to get a nice strong signal that's uh, getting past all the badges. Um, uh, there was also the first one was going to have uh, one LED, so I thought, why not have three, nice and bright? Um, and also Artnet. Um, I trained as a theatre technician, and uh, Artnet is the network version of DMX. And DMX is the kind of control protocol that you use for lighting and moving lights and theatrical stuff. Uh, so all of these nodes can actually be used by lighting desks. So if somebody brought their own lighting desk, they could use it. Um, they also, uh, the first version used five amp hour batteries from China uh, that when I tested them, they were more like 500 milliamps. Uh, so they wouldn't have lasted long either. Um, but luckily I managed to find the same supplier that Adafruit uses for their batteries. Um, and whilst it's not the cheapest, they are actually the rated uh, amount that they say. So the new nodes now have 8.8 uh, .8 amp hours um, and they can pull quite a lot of power from them. Um, I thought, there's space on the board, so let's add a connector for NeoPixels. So they can also do strips of NeoPixels now. Um, and before they were just going to be in Tupperware boxes that I found. I thought it needs to be bigger. So uh, making boxes out of uh, rubble sacks, which sounds like a good idea until you realize that woven plastic is like a dull cheese grater. So when I'm flipping them inside out to put them through our sewing machine, uh, my hands got ripped to shreds. Uh, so I regret that quite a lot. Next year, well, next EMF, it's going to be different. Um, and originally it was going to be 10, but now it's 50 around the campsite because quantity means cheaper, but I also didn't factor in quantity means I'm going to be sitting in front of Netflix uh, for a lot of time. Um, I've, I've based how long this project has taken me mostly in series of Netflix. Uh, making all of the big cube housing was four series of Deep Space Nine. Um, <laughs> so that, that, that took quite a while. Um, so this is the custom PCB that I ended up uh, making. It's got uh, an ESP8266. Uh, it runs the, uh, the wireless and all of the, the logic for it. Um, there's three uh, boost uh, LED drivers. Uh, it's got a 3.7 volt lithium ion in it. Um, it boosts that up to about 12 volts or so to light up the LEDs and then PW ohms for all the nice colors. And then also on the uh, bottom right, there's a connector for a NeoPixel strip if you want to put those in. Um, and on the color changing that you've seen uh, at the moment uh, going through the rainbow, they last about nine hours on the batteries before I go around in the morning and charge them all up. And uh, yeah, I've got those all manufactured and brought across. And then I sat and placed about 5,000 components by hand, uh, which was actually quite fun. 
Um, I also realized I needed chargers. Um, they're all uh, nice one amp hour uh, chargers for the batteries that let me charge them uh, individually rather than having to do a whole pack slowly. Uh, I also had some space left on the PCB, so I thought, why not make it an Internet of Things? Because that's, that's the cool thing these days. Um, so yeah, they, they can tweet me once they're finished charging. Um, I regret being one of those people, but uh, yeah. Um, so in my tent at the moment is uh, lots and lots of chargers. Uh, I can do half of the nodes in one go and then flip them over and do the other half. Uh, so if you see a giant lithium fire raging over near the dome, it's probably my tent, just uh, keep a wide berth. Uh, so yeah, the housings are um, cheap industrial rubble bags with bamboo canes and uh, webbing sewn in to uh, keep them in place to give them structure. Uh, luckily, our sewing machine, uh, we bought it to make corsets, which uh, means that it can go through about an inch of leather at speed uh, with no problems. So it can do several layers of plastic quite nicely. Uh, mostly, the only bad thing about it is that it goes so fast, I'm like, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I managed to make 50 of those without killing myself. I only killed three needles, which I feel proud about, but probably should have done better. Um, <laughs> people in my local park have been looking at me very oddly uh, when I've been out there at nine o'clock or midnight once I'd finished uh, testing out new bits and pieces. Um, so if you're in the Hammersmith area and you saw a random guy, that was me. Um, I also built a control server for it. Rather than just having uh, standard Artnet, um, there's a Node.js server which uh, gives me an overview of all of the nodes. They heartbeat back to the server with their current voltage, uh, their settings, so I can see uh, their calibration. And then that all goes into here. I can see which ones are live, which ones have run out of battery, so I need to go and charge them up. Um, I can also enable, disable, and, and mess around with them. Um, I spent far too long making an auto-updating graph, so I can see as their power's running out or uh, if anything's wrong with them. And a few uh, tools which I need to flesh out, but uh, I feel like God when I'm standing up on top of the, the hill, seeing all of these nodes around the place, and then just going off, on, off, on. But, uh, yeah, so if you see me with an iPad giggling to myself, that's that's why. Um, so yeah, there, there's 25 chargers, 50 nodes, 150 RGB LEDs, um, quite a lot of stuff. It looks more impressive when there's big numbers, but um, it all adds up into these nodes that are, I hope, pretty. Um, there's uh, an open API with the control server. Uh, and if you go to any of these links, um, or just search for uh, Lumos nodes. Um, there's a GitHub page with all the details. Uh, you can do HTTP requests uh, with uh, Jossen data. You can get uh, information of all the nodes that are online, their battery status, what color they are. And then you can uh, post it back, and you can set the color of any of them. Uh, currently, there's no uh, API keys, so anybody can set them, and if people are fighting, they're going to change color. So I'd love it if anybody wants to write some really nice stuff for um, the nodes that are around. We put up 10 on the ridge last night, so if anybody wants to make a Larson scanner that goes across there, that would be awesome. Um, just hit me up on uh, Twitter or um, Freenode, my details are at the end, and I'll turn off other scripts so you can play with them whilst they're running. Uh, but all of the code will be open source and open hardware. I haven't put on the licenses yet, but you'll find all of those details on there. Um, huge thank you to uh, Nexus Interactive Arts. Uh, they sponsored the project and gave me uh, some money to buy all of the hardware. Uh, they're an awesome company who work a lot with Google on their Made With Code projects, uh, which is designed to get uh, girls, young girls into coding. Uh, we did uh, the White House's lawn for their um, Christmas trees a couple of years ago where you could use uh, Blockly, which is a visual programming language, to animate uh, their trees, which was partly where the idea for this came from, and also LED dresses and stuff. Um, thank you to Adrian Godwin, if he's around, um, who 
put up with me poking him at one o'clock in the morning on IRC going, I chose the wrong drivers and they're not working. Please help me. Um, and uh, if you're around tonight, uh, my friend Tom Wyatt is making a uh, Vive experience over in the Gold Members Lounge. Uh, it's so um, he's making a version of uh, his own visual scripting language. So you put on the VR and you can drag around uh, components, make chases, do color transitions, and then that all gets propagated out to the nodes that are all around the place. Uh, so if you haven't used a Vive before, it's a good excuse to come over and play with one. And uh, thank you to everybody else who's lent me their pictures for this talk. And yeah, if you'd like to get involved, and I'd really love that you do, because at the moment it's just my laptop running uh, a rainbow chase uh, during the night, hit me up on Twitter or on Freenode, I'm Slexius, and yeah, that's my nodes. <laughs> they say a good lightning talk should be like a comet, right? It should be uh, dazzling and brilliant and over in a flash. Um, and I certainly feel that that was. Um, I like the blinking lights, the shiny lights. I know other people do too. Um, so thanks again for all of that. And apologies uh, for not being able to put you on yesterday. Um, so hopefully you guys will get out there and write some code and play with the API and do some other stuff. Um, our next speaker is going to speak to us about uh, robots, I believe, um, and uh, in particular dangerous things. Does anyone here like danger? Uh, once again, the right-hand side, left-hand side, what are you doing? Are you sleeping? Are you awake? All right, now the left-hand side. Non-danger, non-danger. Ah, okay, good. Um, so, yes, are you ready? I think so. Robert is ready, and he's going to talk to you about uh, building your first combat robot, I believe, right? Music doesn't work. Okay, never mind. Huh? Music doesn't work. That's okay. fine. All right. It should do. You should be able to just play it. Eh, just going to try the presentation anyway. Okay, as you wish. Warm round of applause for Robert. Uh, how do I get it up? Oh, there you go. Okay, cool. Hi. So, um, this is talking about building your first combat robot. Uh, robot Wars has just started back on TV. Uh, it'll be on tonight, 8 p.m. BBC Two. I don't know if you can actually get iPlayer in the tent at the, on the campsite at the moment, because um, BBC thinks. Yeah, it thinks we're in Germany or something. Um, so yeah, I'm Robert. Um, I've been into combat robotic stuff since about 1998, which is when the first season started up. Um, that's my website, that's my Twitter, so feel free to give us a poke, a prod, later on. So, and this is just covering my experiences. I don't profess to be any sort of professor or expert on this yet. Um, give us a bit of time. Um, so in the UK, you've got three what classes because you've got to split robots into weight classes the ones you see on tv are heavyweights right at the bottom there they cost about 100 well sorry they weigh about 100 kilos um, i think we've gone up to 110 kilos now for the new robot wars um they cost anywhere from two grand to about eight grand um which is a lot of money um so the one i just carried up on stage is a featherweight they're a little bit more cheaper so that one's about 800 quid that's 13.6 kilos uh it's quite popular for getting started it's big enough that you learn how to build robots it's small enough that it doesn't break the bank there's another type called beta weights they're 1.36 kilos um they're about 200 quid maybe or less you can get away with a lot less for a beta weight they're f they're absolutely tiny um they're also good for getting into robots if you're into that if you want to start so the way i look at building robots is balance you You'll find more money, but you won't find more weight. Um, you're, it, it's always, oh, just another speed controller, just another motor. Um, but you have a limit on how many grams something can weigh, and you can't change that. If you can, talk to me afterwards. Um, so you've got to split what weight you have on your chassis, um, the thing that everything else gets bolted into, the armor that stops you getting beaten up, um, some sort of drive motion system so you can actually drive around and something to hit the other guy with. And if you focus on one of them, then you lose out on the others. So starting with the chassis, everything bolts to it. Every time you get hit, it's going to go into the chassis. So the chassis needs to be able to take that hit, needs to be kind of rigid, um, which will include you getting thrown up in the air a couple of meters and then dropping on your weakest edge. Um, so that's something to think about. 
Uh, you can be a little cheeky and make the chassis and the armor the same thing. But then if someone hits the armor hard enough, your chassis gets bent, which means wheels don't touch the ground. So that's what my chassis looks like. Once you take away all the outside skin on my little robot down here at the front. Um, you've got the two big motors at the top that make it move. And then the big motor in the middle makes the arm go up and down. So armor is quite important because you're not going to dodge everybody. Um, you're always going to get hit. Um, the two popular ones are special steel, um, the stuff they use to make digger buckets out of. It's very tough, um, but it's very heavy. The other option is plastic um, to use chopping boards. Um, well, HDPE. Uh, you can, because it's so light, you can make it really thick, um, and it has this really weird tendency to tear rather than um, stick together. So when a big weapon hits you, it just tears a chunk out of your armor rather than tearing the armor chunk off of your robot, um, which is useful because it means the rest of the armor is still there for the next hit. There's always another hit. Um, you want to avoid vertical sides, oops, um, and you want to avoid sharp corners, double oops, because um, what happens is with spinning weapons, they will catch these, these edges, and then they will drag your robot and throw it around. Um, don't know if you've watched the first episode of Robot Wars, but you saw the little robots getting thrown out of the arena. Yeah, that was um, sharp corners and flat sides. So that's what my robot looks like. Um, so I'm covered in the thick art steel armor. And I've got polycarbonate onto the top of the bottom. Uh, it's not particularly strong, but it is very light and it does look cool. So motion. That's all about kind of putting big motors in. Um, you, 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 need to have, you need to be able to drive around so you can control the arena. So you can put your opponent where he doesn't want to be and where you want him to be namely in front of your weapon. Um, you'll find a lot of people are quite bad at driving their robots and they constantly do bad things like driving into the wall instead of driving at the other guy or driving into the pit. And that's because a lot of people don't practice enough. The only time they actually drive the robot is when they're fighting it. They don't take it home and have a play round in the garden or out in the street. And it's really fun, so you should totally do that. Um, these days, a lot of people are using cordless drills for featherweights. So you go down to Homebase, Halfords, Argos, something like that. You buy yourself a cheap 18-volt cordless drill. Take off all the plastic. You've got a nice, powerful motor. You've got a nice gearbox. And you've got a nice big shaft to put wheels on. It's great. Um, and then for speed controllers, there's an Australian company that takes very cheap Chinese brushless motor controllers and turns them into brushed motor controllers by changing software. Um, it's the cheapest one out there. There are others that are better and more expensive, heavier. So there's a lot of options. So that's what mine looks like. So I've got one big motor at the back, and then that drives one wheel, and then I've got a belt that drives the front wheel. So I've got four wheels. I've kind of got four-wheel drive, but with only two motors. Um, works quite well until the belts come off, and then it kind of sucks. Um, so weapons. So if you have been watching the Robot Wars, or even the American BattleBots, which is on at the moment, which is awesome, um, Spinners are amazing. They 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 look kind of simple because they're just basically some metal bar or disc with a tooth, and then they spin it really, really, really fast. And if it hits you, it kills you. Um, so they're quite simple, but they, they, there's a lot of nuance in it, and it's quite hard to get right. Um, the other option is flippers. So you use pneumatics, which is something that's been very popular in the kind of the off television robot wars that's been happening. Um, it's probably the most effective weapon. The way the UK arenas are built is we have a gutter around the outside of the arena. So if you can throw your opponent into that gutter, they've lost. Um, and it means you don't take damage, they don't take damage, and you can win a fight in three seconds. And people have done that. Unfortunately, it makes for terrible TV, which is why they've um, changed the arena to not have such a big gutter now. Um, the other option is just to be a rambot. So lots of armor, lots of big motors, and just drive into the other guy at full speed. 13 kilos running at about 20 miles an hour will hurt. Um, I'd show you my weapon, but it's really awkward to show, so I'll probably have it going in a second at the end of the talk. Um, so it's not very easy. There is no perfect robot. You get to keep having a go at it. Um, it's quite good. I mean, as long as you build it all right, it's very rare for your robot to get torn into complete shreds. Um, so you can iteratively tweak stuff and make it better and fix the thing that broke last time. And most of all, it's really good fun. 
Um, so for finding out about building stuff, these are places to go. So the fightingrobots.co.uk is where pretty much all the guys from Robot Wars hang out. Um, there are uh, live events, so that's stuff held at leisure centres and the like, roughly every month and a half, two months. So it's worth going along to them, uh, either as a look-see or just to watch robots kick the shit out of each other. Um, there's the American website, spark.tools, which is where a lot of the guys from BattleBots and the other homegrown events hang out. You've got Robot Wars... Robowars.com is the Australian website. The Australians have got some nice robots going on. Uh, e to the I Pi plus one is um, this American guy from MIT who does some nice robots that's worth looking at. He also does some nice silly vehicles. Um, so I'm from Cambridge Makespace, which is where I built most of my robots. Uh, we've got some great kit. And yeah, find your local hacker space. It's full of cool kit. Um, yeah. Do we have any time for questions? We have a uh, minute and a half. There you go. minute and a half. I can't see nothing. Show my weapon. <laughs> it's a family show. Family show. <laughs> so you have something called a little key, which I don't know if you can see. So you need to be able to remove that to stop it from going out of control and hurting people. Of course, you always lose it. So yeah, that can toss about 30 kilos up in the air. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, now we have to do the changeover. I don't believe I've ever had to do a, a robot changeover before. That's a, that's a first for me. Um, so we'll remove the robot from the stage, and our next presentation involves a demo. Uh, Bob Durham's going to get up and do something very special for us in just a moment. Um, and I know it involves uh, two of my favorite scientists, right? Uh, one, of you, one of whom uh, unified theories of time and gravity. I'm sure you know who that is. And uh, another one who uh, unified theories of electricity and magnetism. Um, does anyone, should, let's just go for it. Like, who are those two gentlemen? Anyone? Einstein and Maxwell. Fantastic, right? Um, I learned recently that Einstein uh, started the work on time because he was trying to unify the time tra the timetables of various uh, railroad stations in different time zones. And so when he got to thinking about relativity, uh, he had kind of already thought about the relationship of time and distance across multiple time zones. Um, hopefully we'll learn a lot more about that stuff in the next few minutes. Um, once again, if you've just come along, they're desperate for volunteers at EMF camp, particularly for speaker ops this evening, um, and for cooking and doing dishes, and they're offering food tokens for people who uh, help out. Um, a lot of things have been done uh, in this kind of temporary autonomous zone by us, um, and I certainly appreciate that. So uh, maybe a warm round of applause for yourselves for uh, setting up camp and uh, sticking it out in this tent while it's very, very warm today. So round of applause. How are you doing? Fine. You all set? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to introduce you to Bob, and he's going to do some demos for you, and um, enjoy yourselves. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bob. Um, uh, today, uh, interestingly enough, um, I'm, I'm a maker, uh, primarily. I used to be a, a professional programmer, but don't do that anymore. Um, now I go to uh, make affairs with my mate Dave, and we call ourselves We Just Like to Make Stuff. You might have seen our table with uh, chess sets that uh, we've made and, and discovered. Um, but we got together. We've known each other a long time, but we got together because we built a heavyweight robot. And it's about the size of that cabinet over there. And uh, we got flipped. We got annihilated. Um, they're harder than you think. And, and it did really cost us over £2,000. But uh, great fun. We got on the telly. And those tellies, the telly competition was actually a quarter final. You have to beat a couple of robots before they let you on. So we didn't do too bad, but uh, we were tired. They're too lean and heavy. Anyway, today, um, I thought I'd talk about electromagnetism. Now, uh, it's very uh, common to assume that everybody knows about electromagnetism, particularly in an event like this. Um, but we find that uh, make affairs, people don't know. or well, they know a little bit. Um, and so hopefully I'll... I'll um, enlighten some of you and those already know that's great um 
Those who don't, hopefully you'll leave knowing. Okay, I'm going to start with a couple of classic demonstrations and then uh, talk more about how they work. Can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me at the back, Mother? Plastic. Number plate. Magnets. Stair rail. If ta this table is level, I can swing this plastic through this, these two magnets. Oops. It's a, it's, a, it's a stage, it's not level, not me. Um, as you see, it's swung quite freely. This is a bit of copper. Um, now they did say, they did, they, I did read somewhere that you shouldn't start a presentation by apologising, so I won't apologise that uh, you can't see it, but uh, take us an opportunity that if you want to see um, some of the demos more closely, we're only up the uh, path up there at the end, uh, and I'll have a table out after this for, for a little while. This is copper, and it's stopped. Okay, so that's a classic demonstration of uh, electromagnetism. I'll come in and... Copper pipe, plastic rule plug. Plastic rule plug, copper pipe. In this hand, one-handed, I'm going to drop the plastic through the pipe. There it goes. Brass bolt. A conductor, brass bolt. Again. Talk amongst yourselves for just a couple of seconds. Uh, I've got no slides to go wrong, but obviously everything else to go wrong. Demos are hard, right? We usually find when doing demos, um, you have to sacrifice a calculator before you get on stage, and then everything works fine. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll turn it into a thought experiment. Just think I've got a little magnet in my fingers. I'm going to drop it through the pipe now. And it comes out the bottom. It drops very, very slowly. It's another classic, easy demonstration of electromagnetism. Uh, and I want to explain what's going on. Here I have a wire. If I pass, if I make a charge, electric charge, move along that wire, which is called a current, I'm going to get. So I'm always going to get something. I'm always going to get a magnetic field produced. That's the electromagnetism bit. I always get a magnetic field. Which is, uh, I can concentrate that magnetic. If I call up the wire, I can concentrate that magnetic field. Um, many times and becomes very effective. Now the converse happens that if I pass, a, if, if um, I can make a magnetic field change or in the presence of an uh, electric charge, I can make the charge move. So suddenly I've got two things now. I've got three things. I've got um, an electric field, magnetic field, and um, movement, okay? So what's happening in this, exp in this uh, demonstration is that my electric charge, which is on top of the metal, the metal um, has, has uh, electrons that are free to move about, uh, they're passing through this, these two magnets, uh, a large magnetic field, um, which, in, which cause those charges to move. And that's called, that's called an eddy current. Okay? And because it's now a moving charge, it generates its own magnetic field, which opposes that of the magnets. And if, if um, 
you come up afterwards to our table, I can show you that that feels quite sticky. It feels like it's going through honey or glue or something. Uh, it's the same with a copper pipe. When I drop a, drop, drop a magnet through here, the, um, the passage of the, the breaking of that field causes uh, eddy currents in the pipe, which then oppose the passage of that magnet, and which is why it runs so slowly, as you saw earlier. Okay, so that's, that's the basics. Big deal, so what? Well, it turns out that this is incredibly useful. I have here, and uh, apologies for those who can't see at the back. Oh, damn, I wasn't going to do that, was I? Um, this, is, this is a coil of wire held in a frame, and around it goes this magnet. So if, if, I, if I turn that course, so I've got the motion, I've got my charge carrier in the wire. What am I going to get out the back? Or rather, it's in a magnetic field. So I'm going to get um, I'm going to get movement of that charge. It's a generator, okay? On built on the same principles as this, the eddy currents. Um, so I can generate. So I can turn that with a windmill. Or I can turn it with a steam generator. Or my electric power station also does this. Just heats water, make it into steam, and turn it. Now, if if um, if I'm going to go the other way, if I put electricity in uh, my moving ch electric charge, electric fields, um, I've got then I've got charge, I've got my magnetic field. What do I get out the back? Motion. So if I put power in, I get motion. That's my electric motor. All for all uh, running from this basic principle of eddy currents. This is. Um, Normally, normally I do this talk um, just with one or two people uh, intimately here, and, I, and they can see things like this, and I can ask, uh, what's this? I'll, I'll try it, what's this? Well, you can't see it, can you? So. <laughs> this is a little electric motor, okay? And we've seen how that worked in my very clear demonstration just now. Does anyone know what this is? It's written on it. This is a stepper motor. So the coils here are arranged not um, continuously, but, in, but um, arranged such that um, the turning motion is, is quite discreet. It turns a step at a time. Uh, very useful for robotic control, skid turning, that sort of thing. Okay, a stepper motor made possible by uh, modern electronics that can control the current going into each individual coil. Now here's a good one. And this usually, this usually fools most people. Does anyone know what this is? This, I'll stop doing that, sorry. This is, this is a brushless motor. Now, I'm sure you've all seen a lot of these, particularly if you've got drones or radical aircraft, because they're very small, very powerful. How does this work compared to the other motor? Well, in this, in, in this one, on both of these examples, I've got my magnet round the outside, and it's the coil of wire that is turning. On this one, I've got coils, inside and it's the magnets that spin so now we don't have to have a brush to carry the current to the coils um, it's electromagnetic induction which um, produces the turning force so very very efficient very lightweight and that's the only difference between a brushless motor and a brushed motor uh, it was mentioned in the previous talk i think we use motors that we found on the internet for our robot and uh, we used to say that they were nose wheel actuators from english electric lightnings but no one really believed us. We didn't know where it would come from. Okay. Okay, I'm getting to the interesting part soon. Everything to hand. This, all this, all this work was done by Faraday, essentially in a workshop. He was trained. He trained as a bookbinder. And he was employed by Davy as, as in his workshop and discovered all this. So it just shows how important making is and doing stuff in your shed, all this practical stuff. This, this is a Faraday torch, sometimes called. It's, there's a magnet here, which I'm bouncing up and down between two springs, and two coils of wire. This is designed so that the current that um, is produced, the electric charge, is stored in a capacitor. and generates electricity, okay? That's how Faraday torch works, and it's all built on the same principle of electromagnetic induction.
Here I have um, a bit of breadboard, which a lot of you will be familiar with. I have here a um, ferrite ring. A ferrite is just something that will concentrate my magnetic field. And I've got a coil of wire. If you remember that uh, uh, a coil of wire quite efficiently makes a magnetic field. I've also got on here a, an LED and a transistor. A transistor is just a switch. On my intimate demo, which is another thought experiment this, I can show that this battery, this one and a half volt battery, is not powerful enough to light that LED. There's not enough juice left in it. However, if I put into this circuit, um, which is called a blocking oscillator, it's a lovely little circuit to make, uh, no soldering involved, it all push, pushes into this breadboard, um, it, uh, the light will then light. The reason is that the um, battery has enough juice in it to turn that transistor on, it only takes about 0.6 volts. That um, current then uh, creates a magnetic field around that coil, so it stores energy in, in the magnetic field. Um, however, um, the way things are, when the, the um, magnetic field is, that is created wants to create its own current, and that's backwards against the current that's changing it. That's Lenz's law, or back EMF. That's enough to turn that transistor off. Uh, so I've got a second, uh, and, and the magnetic field will collapse, again generating a current. Now I've got a secondary winding here, which takes that current and feeds it to the light which added to the limited power in the battery lights the light. Uh, this is called a, uh, and, then, and then because there's no um, back EMF, the transistor can then turn on again and the whole cycle uh, starts again. This is called a blocking oscillator and it oscillates about a um, thousand hertz. Preparation, you see, I've learned a lot. Preparation is the key. This is another example, and it's called a mini Tesla coil. This is exactly the same thing, except that my coils, my two coils on my ferrite ring are now on a ferrite rod, and I've got one of my, one of my um, coils, the pickup coil, has many, many more turns than the original coil. Um, this is effectively a transformer. It'll transform um, the power I put, the voltage I put into it, into a higher voltage, and this is demonstrated by the fact that here I'm not using LEDs; I'm actually using neons. Neons are what we used to have as LEDs in the old days before LEDs were invented. Um, these are little tubes of gas that arc at about 90 volts, and I'm running out from a 9 volt battery. So you can see that just by using induction and changing the number of turns between those two. Um, coils of wire, I can, get, I can get at least 90 volts out of that, and you see all those lights being lit. What you can't see is that these, the, all the legs of these neons are joined together in a kind of W shape, and on this end, there's, no, there's nothing. Nothing connects to it. How are those being lit? Well, the answer is in the previous um, circuit. It's an oscillator. This one is oscillating at about 1 megahertz. Now that is a radio frequency, and so essentially all those neons are acting as an antenna. And the uh, oscillating electric wave is coming out the end and disappearing off into space. Okay? Uh, and we see that's working. You have to take it from me that that's not um, joined. I can, I can short it and light that last one. The battery is a bit, bit low. All right, yes, um, let off. it's not the exciting bit, but let me, um, this, is, this is an antenna. This is a, a, an Uda Yagi antenna. Uda was the uh, student, ya and Yagi was his supervisor, but he gets his name on it, so sometimes people call these Yagi antennas. Now, I want to mention this because this is, this is part of an electromagnetic system. This antenna is tuned, and it's tuned to uh, two different frequencies. Determined, uh, determined by the length of these um, uh, of these arms. This is a quarter dipole antenna. Uh, it's got 
when fully assembled, it's got two, uh, some more radial arms that are two meters, and it's for satellite communication, basically, 70 centimeters up, two meters down. So you can communicate with satellites using this, all based on that principle of um, electromagnetism. I didn't get to mention, um, how many seconds? How many, uh, um, well, I think we should probably cut it off there because right. the next speakers need to come in. But um, Bob does have a demo table somewhere in the camp. Where is that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, no, 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 no. It's, upstaged, it's, upstaged. It's just uh, it's just on the path. So, okay. so I. So can, why don't you invite people to come and see your demo, uh, which is on which path? It's it's up near the uh, accessible camping, just on the corner there. So it's up the main one of these uh, paved paths up here. Fantastic. So just, just keep an eye out for the demo and, and go and see Bob again. And we'll yeah. talk about, yeah, sorry, that's about half no, it's fine. A warm round of applause. Um, thanks, Bob. You're too kind, too generous. Thank you. I have to admit, that is the most uh, meta presentation I think I've ever seen uh, about uh, EMF at EMF. So that was kind of fantastic. Um, and apologies to the three Lightning Talk speakers who didn't get a chance to speak this year. Um, but again, uh, meet them outside and go and have demos inside the little camps. Um, that's part of what EMF is about, is just doing it um, anywhere. Sit down and uh, have a conversation and learn some stuff from each other. And um, thank you again for coming and seeing all the Lightning Talk speakers. I've had a difficult time uh, because I I usually work in circus and burlesque and cabaret, keeping it clean. Um, so uh, particularly with the Faraday torch, you know, I found that that was a notable sort of moment for me. Um, and so thanks for coming, if you did.